So I'm, uh, I'm Tim Carr, I'm, I'm the Senior Director of Strategy with Free Press. Uh, this panel is called Building Blogs for Dissidents. It's, a, it's about looking at uh, dissident voices on the web and, and ways to protect those, both uh, looking at the work that's being done by technologists and also looking at possible structural issues. And I, I wanted to, oh, there it is. I wanted to set it up with about a uh, five minute presentation. So I hope you'll indulge me in, um, because it kind of um, sets the history of this discussion, and I think that's important. Um, this is a this is a quote that we often refer to at Free Press. That's a that's from James Madison. It's a popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy, or perhaps both. Knowledge will forever govern govern ignorance, and a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power that knowledge gives. So it's a little wordy, but this was the uh, early 19th century. Um, another one, George Orwell, if large numbers of people believe in freedom of speech, there will be freedom of speech, even if the law forbids it. But if public opinion is sluggish, inconvenient minorities will be persecuted, even if laws exist to protect them. Uh, another one, Evelyn Beatrice Hall, she said, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death. You're right to say it. That's actually attributed to her. It's been attributed to, to other men, or men, and, uh, but it's actually attributed to her. So basically, this is my interpretation. Government has a proactive role in protecting free speech and promoting, to quote Madison, the means of the party. Second, second it's, not mere, it's not enough to have laws People must actively defend freedom of expression every day or risk losing it. And uh, Hall, we must defend everyone's right to speak freely, even those expressing radical or unpopular views. So I want to take you even further back in history to something that happened in 2011, the Occupy movement. Um, I, I uh, played hooky from my day job to photograph the movement in New York City. Um, and. Um, and as I was taking these pictures of people, um, I noticed that something was apparent. I was taking pictures of people speaking, people holding signs, people holding signs and speaking. Um, and I noticed in these photographs that there were also present where these sort of ever present ubiquitous mobile devices or other devices. People were using mobile phones, obviously, just to, to tweet their friends, to tweet, tweet the issue, look at or, or tweet uh, about what they were seeing, to email their friends, to connect. Um, but they were also using the record actions that were taking place on the streets. In particular, there were, there were a lot of efforts to record the arrests that were occurring during the Occupy movement, as it appeared, at least in New York City, but also in places like Oakland and elsewhere, um, that they were targeting people, not only protesters, but people who were actually uh, reporting things. Um, in the, in Zakani Square, there was even an effort to to build their own media alternative. They built this media center um, that was their effort to route around traditional media. And uh, the idea was that you know CNN, the New York Times, etc., are not going to cover our issue correctly. We're going to create our own media. Um, they built a media center right in the middle of the square. They tapped into a local public Wi-Fi network. They were using all sorts of things. And the, the idea behind the, this was basically that in order to get their message out, um, they had to create an alternative network that relied on devices, applications, um, networks, and the audience. And in, in, a, in a perfect world, it was this kind of virtuous circle where they could connect directly to their audience, their audience could provide feedback, um, and in that way they would route around uh, traditional media, get their message out, uh, and create a, revolution, you know, create a revolutionary idea in communications. Um, and this is kind of where I want to set up the panel, is just that this idea failed. And it failed because each of these levels, the applications, the devices, the network, and even the audience fail. Uh, at, the, at the device level, you had, of course, phones that were being monitored. 
Um, you were having citizen journalists who were arrested just by virtue of holding up a phone. Um, at the application level, we have problems with social media, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, um, even Ustream to some extent, which was being used by some uh, what was uh, failing, some of the accounts were being suspended. The network level, of course, we have problems with the networks being blocked. Um, we have uh, issue of net neutrality, which poses a threat to these types of communications. And then at the audience level, we still have a problem with the digital divide here in the United States, where, where tens of millions of people can't get connected. And, you know, the Occupy movement was about economic justice, and their audience was really a lot of the people who were on the wrong side of the digital divide. Um, so I want to just set that up. Uh, the, to put the failure of the Occupy movement as kind of a case study that we can discuss uh, the issue of, of dissident media. And one of the arguments that we're hearing a lot, and I admit this is a bit of a, a straw man, but is this idea that you can, these problems that exist with suppression of dissident voices, you can kind of tech around them. There have been you know, very good arguments by people out there saying that you know, we can't rely on policy, uh, if you look in the United States at, at an organization like the FCC, the FCC is incredibly corrupt. Um, it has failed to protect consumers in, 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 and therefore we need to find alternative solutions and technology. And the other argument is that um, you need structural policy in order for some of the things that our panelists work on in order to succeed. You need unlicensed spectrum in some cases if people are using public Wi-Fi networks that are not run by, um, by carriers. So I want to just put that out, this idea about these sort of, you know, again, I admit this is a bit of a straw man, these kind of opposing ideas of like, can you tech around it? Or do you need policy? What is the balance between the two? Uh, and ask our panelists, starting with Chris, that's all right, yeah. um, about your experiences, the work that you're doing, and how you kind of address this balance between technology and policy and where you think uh, it best sits. Thanks, Tim. Um, I'm, I'm Chris Riley. I'm with Priscilla. I, I do open internet policy for them. Um, I spent uh, three and a half years working with Tim at Free Press and then did a tour through the State Department. Uh, so I've seen a, a few different sides of this um, this uh, theory of change uh, for, for activism. And, and I mean, I, I use slightly different words than you do. Uh, uh, I would. I, I don't think really in terms of dissidents. I think that's an accurate term. It's just not how I think of it. Uh, but I think of it a lot in terms of underdogs, right? Because to me, when you're talking about the FCC and how, how to try to get a good public interest outcome there, when you're talking about the Occupy movement, when you're talking about uh, those of us on on the side that everyone at this conference is on of surveillance reform and security, um, you are talking about people who are facing long odds in, in advancing the change that they want. And so it has to be, uh, for me, a, a, an all fronts, uh, an all fronts challenge, an all fronts campaign, an all fronts assault um, of, are there things that we can do with technology to advance our vision for the world? Are there things we can do with policy advocacy and, and legal change and activism to advance our vision for the world? And I would add a third front um, depending on how you view it, as a uh, culture or sort of community, um, are the things we can do there, because that's different. Um, and for me, I mean, my reflection back on the Occupy movement was it was really great on community, really great, it built an amazing community, um, really got a message out there, uh, didn't have a, a clear legal ask, in my opinion, uh, others may disagree, um, and, and uh, there were some interesting technology things being done. I was a little bit not germane to that problem, but when you get it back into sort of the surveillance issues, net neutrality issues, internet governance, those are all things that I work on. Um, you can sort of think about these, these three paths all in parallel. Um, I've thought about this a lot on the surveillance front in particular, because in my view, there are a lot of, uh, I, I'm really glad so many people at this event and in this country and, in, and around the world are looking at surveillance and how that has changed in the digital age and how complicated it has become. I and mean, I'm glad that people are looking at it from the technology point of view, trying to build better tools, trying to build more useful tools. I'm glad people are looking at it from the legal point of view, trying to change FISA in the United States, uh, trying to build legal policy principles that are applicable to surveillance around the entire world, which Access has been doing. Um, and my, my uh, which many people are playing, it's not just me, but, but one of the things that I tend to say a lot is, I want these two groups working together more. 
Um, and I try to talk to other people about how we can build more comprehensive theories of change that include lovely reform, technology reform, and cultural or, or community gatherings and, and change as well um, as part of this big picture. Hi, my name is James Ozeal. I'm with the Open Internet Tools Project. Um, so Tim's question was the interplay between technology and policy and where we should be putting our limited resources to make change and make room for dissent. And I will start from the, the viewpoint that policy is permission, which is to say that you know, when you don't have a lot of dissent, it's very easy to have open policies. Or when you don't have a lot of effective dissent or threatening dissent, um, policies tend to look much more welcoming to the dissent that isn't really happening, or at least not happening effectively. And if you were to take a survey of all the countries in the world that are right now struggling with civil unrest, you will find that in the last year or so, many of them have moved their policies away from structures that have room for any sort of dissent and towards rules and mechanisms that make anonymity online a lot harder, that require identity registration, that filter the web in stronger and more nefarious ways. And so policy turns out to be really unreliable. All the places where, where we have strong traditions of free speech, um, even in those places, throughout history, whenever that society has felt threatened and things have been dicey and people have felt like they couldn't trust their neighbors, those policies just sort of disappeared. They either weren't enforced or they were explicitly changed or you know, one-time exceptions in times of emergency were, were made and then extended over and over again. So I regard policy as somewhat difficult to trust. Technology, on the other hand, is, is a thing you put in a place in an environment and it follows rules and it's either gonna work or it's not gonna work, but it's gonna be subject less to the whims of whatever's going on around it. But of course, all technology is, is deployed in a space that is shaped by policy, and all of policy is a bunch of rules about technology that shifts over time. So there's a huge interplay between the two. And a lot of the tech stuff that those of us who are doing around trying to secure freedom for people to do secure communication is not done with the notion that we are going to forever solve the technology and free people and they'll magically be able to communicate securely despite any sort of other technology or policy opponent. The idea is to change the reality on the ground so that the policy environment forces policymakers to, to make hard choices. And our, my hope is that we can use technology to push policymakers to have to contend with the things that we think are important and have to contend with dissent in new ways. So that to me is the interplay between technology and dissent. And you can see that in a lot of projects where the, the goal of certain projects is to try to force policymakers to have to make hard choices in what to censor and what not to censor. To, to disable a censor's ability to finally parse what information they're going to let through and force censors to wholesale block things that they might not want to block in order to get to include in that sweep the messages of dissent. And if we start to do that, then we really do start to have an effect on policy. And that's how a lot of this stuff turns into winning scenarios, at least in, in my mind. My name is Elmer Seta. I'm a principal security engineer at OpenITP and also technical director at the International Modern Reading Institute at Iceland. Um, so I'm actually going to disagree a little bit with James and, and possibly even shock him slightly by saying that I think policy is an extremely reliable instrument <laughs> in very specifically defined arenas. And this is um, so if we look at the ways in which policy shapes commerce, policy shapes the um, regulatory regime in which telcos operate, policy shapes the response the commercial responsibilities of companies, and then the second order effect on how that changes the technology that they design in terms of whether we, we talk about tax breaks, software liability, you know, there's any number of ways that we can start shaping this stuff. That kind of policy is actually quite reliable over time, even over, over decades as far as shaping the socio-technical environment that comes out of it. 
Um, and what that, that is a very useful tool from the arena of governance to specifically constrain some of the actions of the corporate world which may be most detrimental to us, right? Because really, when we're talking about Verizon, you know, for example, you know, what do they do that, that's damaging? Well, okay, maybe they give away a bunch of data to the NSA, but actually I think, you know, loss of network neutrality has a much, much, much greater impact or, um, you know, the, the price levels for internet access that we see in the US versus most of the rest of the developed world, those things have a much greater impact on large-scale social evolution than their interaction with NSA. Now, on the flip side, um, what government can't do very much, you know, so policy is, a, policy is a terrible tool for constraining government because government <laughs> creates policy and that's one of the things it's very good at doing and if policy suddenly decides, you know, if, if government decides that policy gets in the way, policy suddenly isn't there anymore. Um, so why would you ever try and use policy to constrain government? It doesn't work. Um, it does work in some specific narrow areas, free speech, has a reasonably, you know, because we have such a strict free speech bar in the US, that has a reasonably good history of being an effective tool. However, we've never seen a case anywhere in the world through history, as far as I can tell, where um, policy has been an effective tool at constraining international surveillance. It just doesn't work. Like, the, you know, that's, that's purely a power game. Everyone does as much as they can do based on the money that they have and, and you know, what their, what their geopolitical goals are. Um, so I would never try to use, use policy there. However, technology is very effective at constraining a lot of the negative impacts of governance structures and, govern and, and surveillance. So, and, and that technology comes from the commercial sector where the government has, or you know, the commercial slash open source sector, where the government has much less impact. So we actually have this really nice um, checks, you know, cross checks and balances, where I think we can actually play these two off of each other very nicely if we're strategic about which problems we try to solve with, with policy and which problems we try to solve with technology. And we do need, for instance, a much less corrupt FCC if those tools are going to happen. You know, we need an FCC which actually has teeth if we want to keep network neutrality. Um, similarly, we need, we need a tech industry that has teeth if we want to stop dragnet surveillance. You're, you're flowing into a lot of things that I wanted to raise really well, so I'm just going to jump in. I also want to say, I, I, I don't, I particularly don't think the FCC is corrupt. I just want to say that. Ineffective, maybe, uh, is an open question. Um, but uh, they, I, I worked there for a year, so I feel obliged to say that. They're good people. Um, they're in a complicated environment. They could use all of us repeatedly going and telling them what we think. Um, never hurts. Uh, I'm sure he can help you with that. Uh, but no, what I really wanted to say was, um, I think we're talking a lot as well about the conflation that these two, two things have, that policy and tech have. Um, and, and a lot of that conflation comes from the role of, of uh, corporations in this, which Elva was starting to talk to. I mean, when you think about Tiger Square, look, the building blocks of Tiger Square were Facebook and Twitter, right? They weren't Twitter. Um, not at first. Now, Tor plays a very important role in a lot of the other uh, modern situations that we're dealing with, and a very, very important role for protecting the parents around the world. But we can't, at this point, escape the role that uh, major tech and internet corporations have. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that we should, I'm definitely not saying that, but we can't. And so it, that's where the policy and the tech divide, and it gets really complicated. Um, and it's to me where the, I, the one thing I really wanted to disagree with that James said is the text reliable. The text reliable, if you build it, if it's open source, if you roll your own, if you know how to use it, um, if you know the operating system it's running on or the device it's running on, but that's not true of most of us. So we're, we're, tech isn't reliable for, for most of us in most circumstances. But I mean, he wouldn't disagree with me. I, just, I would also say it fails for a lot of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, do you want to follow up here too? No, but uh, there's a woman in the audience who yes. has been raising her hand. And, and if others have questions, we decided to not use the back screen, so I'm, I'm happy to just, you know, if you raise your hand, we'll, we'll get it to you. Get the mic to you. Sure. Do you want to talk into the mic? Sure. Here, why not? I just hand it this one. So, hi. Um, my name is Kalia. Yes, I know it's kind of a wire coming <laughs> but that's my real name. And um, 
I'm also known as Identity Woman, and I'm an independent advocate for rights and dignity of our digital selves. And I'm, you're talking about policy and tech, and policy and tech as if they're in like separate universes, and there's a magic place where they all intersect called a trust framework. Who has heard of a trust framework? Nobody, right? So anyways, I work with digital identity, and there's this open government initiative that's not very open, but nonetheless, anybody can join where they're looking at defining the contractual agreements between people and service providers like your utility company or your bank and how you could take credentials from your bank and go use it at the government or how different commercial entities can ask you for your digital identity online. And it's within something called the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace. And I'm sort of freaked out because there's almost no civil society involvement. And this technology and policy stuff gets all merged together in something called a trust framework and can't really be pulled apart once it's going. And so I'm really keen on hearing, you know, who is tracking this stuff around trust frameworks and the implications for digital identity online and our rights because it's really important. Did, did anyone want to answer that? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not closely plugged in. I have heard of that, actually, the, that, that process, um, but I'm not closely plugged in with it. I will say it taps into uh, a lot of things that are going on that a lot of the industry companies in California are paying a lot of attention to, um, coming out of the privacy space, coming out of how data is managed, um, how privately, uh, pri how PII is managed and shared. So I think there's a nexus there of, uh, of companies, um, some of whom are evolving their internal privacy and security operations into a sort of a trust initiative. There's a handful of companies out here that have trust officers. Um, I think it's a parallel process. I don't think it's necessarily as well integrated as, as I'm sure many of us would like it to be. Um, and there are a few phases, right? You get together in DC, you talk about a framework, you talk about it at the abstract level. It takes a couple years, it gets a little bit watered down, it comes out with something. Then that has to proceed into standards discussions, and then that still has to proceed into technology. So there's still, I'm sure, some phases and hopefully some more opportunities for civil society to come in and start start building some things. But I mean, obviously, this is an important issue. Thanks. Were there any other questions? OK. Um, so you raised this question about the third, Chris, about the third aspect of this. You have policy, you have technology, then you have third aspect, community and culture. And uh, it reminds me of what a, a sociologist on pop culture, Jeffrey Chang, often talks about, which is that in order that um, that policy only follows shifts in culture, and that you wouldn't have had a lot of the, uh, it, it, it connects a lot of the changes of the civil rights movement to shift in culture and accepting Jackie Robinson into the major leagues. Um, and I think a lot of people argue whether that's valid or not, but it, but we're at a moment right now where people, certainly at this conference, thinks that we've arrived at a cultural moment where people are recognizing the need to aggressively protect privacy and free speech, especially in the internet space. Um, and that's a recognition within this conference, but do we feel like, or does anyone, in, this is open to anyone, do you feel like that has crossed over into popular culture to the extent where it can move policy on issues like privacy, on issues like net neutrality, on issues like copyright, on issues like open access? Well, really quickly, I don't know if you can, can conflate these just because um, some of the early surveys that have been done have, have very different results for each of those different issues. Um, unfortunately, I think we're close to that moment, but I, don't, I definitely don't think we're there yet. Um, there's a healthy percentage of people in those surveys that still are not particularly concerned about their own privacy, whether from corporations or from governments, and until that percentage of people goes down, until we get a more and more, I don't think we've quite yet hit critical mass um, anywhere in the world. Uh, yeah, I think the United States, uh, you get further in Germany and in some other countries than you do in the United States, but I still think globally, and especially in the United States, there's still a little bit of ways to go, but I mean, I, I'm as much a believer as anyone that, that we are heading in that direction and that we need to get there. I think and this is this is a little bit of a tangent, but on some of these issues specifically around things like anonymity, 
where there is a lot of government or intelligence community interest in specific outcomes of cultural change, is actually, and I'll, I will put on my, my tinfoil hat for just a little bit here, which I think is maybe a thing that we get to do a little bit more often. Um, but you know there are there are active processes working to change cultural opinions around a lot of issues that people think have you know national security importance. Um, there was actually a moment uh, when was it 2011? I think they um, both changed the name of and legalized the use of what used to be called psyops in domestic populations, um, and it would be really interesting to see what kind of work is being done to intentionally try and shape community opinion there and, and cultural opinion. And I think that there are probably things that we as a community can also do a lot to try and organize our own you know, work at the cultural level. You know, we spend a lot of time in civil society um, engaged with kind of the <coughs> policy world um, we don't spend as much time reaching out to our friends in Hollywood, reaching out to our friends in the music industry. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are a number of different games that can be played there, and I think it would be really interesting for this community to start engaging in more oppositional culture work. So, you know, the question of where public opinion is at is interesting. I think another interesting aspect of that is how how far would public opinion have to go to really make a difference when it comes to things like government surveillance. I mean, you know, if lots and lots of people are unhappy with government surveillance, government's answer is to not tell the people about the surveillance. And so we can we can have fear about it and we can be concerned about it, and we can, you know, organize another church commission, but at the end of the day, there are structures in place to do surveillance, and they're not going to be that constrained by public opinion. In my opinion. I just don't see that happening. So there is one thing which does actually pretty effectively constrain uh, intelligence agencies, and that's money. Um, they, they are still subject to the laws of capital, and that's one thing that we can actually do. If you look at the history of NSA, one of the things that did effectively constrain their activities during the 70s was that they had no money. Um, now, a lot of other you know, government entities also didn't have any money, um, but defunding does work, um, and defunding works reliably, and defunding actually does really useful things for us as a, as a, as a um, civil society, because defunding forces them to focus more on their core mission. They don't get to do all of, the, all of the other stuff. They have to focus on the things that have significant ROI, which is what we think they should be doing anyway for the most part. Um, and in particular, that means a lot less dragnet surveillance because dragnet surveillance doesn't work. You know, it's it's expensive. Um, it, sometimes you happen to find something, but the targeted surveillance is what produces the real results. Um, defunding is a thing that can be driven very effectively by popular opinion, especially when we start talking about you know I don't know get the Tea Party to run something about tax load and uh, you know tax tax levels and the amount of money that we're wasting on. All of the, you know, I mean, there are there are arguments there that, that play fairly well all the way across the political spectrum, um, for very very good reasons um, that will make a real impact. I want to add to that because it's a great point. We in the United States Congress came surprisingly close in one house to approving legislation to defund the NSA's surveillance practices. I mean, when this was introduced, I think a lot of us didn't take it very seriously, and I mean. But I think we were right too. I don't know that we would have made it through the Senate and under any circumstances. And as it is, it didn't make it through the House. But funding is a real, really big deal. And there's another aspect of funding which is a really big deal, and that's campaign funding, right? We're a few members in the House short of passing that bill. Funding in campaigns in the United States Congress is an incredible, incredible tool. Um, and if that becomes something that becomes influenced by public opinion in an organized, uh, uh, public interest, psyops, marshaled, and and, uh, and strategized away, um, we can make a big difference. And, and I think we would all, those of us on the panel, and I think most of us at this conference, would love, love, love to see surveillance be a major campaign issue in the midterms of the United States this fall. I don't know if it's going to be, um, but I think I'm going to do what I can to help try and make it one, because I think we could see incredible long-term results on it.
there are any questions? Um, so just to, um, so this idea of, of changes in culture affecting changes in policy. Um, Want to get a little more particular about that, especially with the work um, around um, adoption of encryption, adoption of new practices by internet users, which, um, which you know, thanks to Edward Snowden, thanks to a lot of work that has gone before that, that wasn't given as much of a hot profile in the media as it has over the last nine months, people are at least aware that there's a problem. They also seem to be aware that there's something they can do to protect themselves. Um, but it, what, when, it, for those of you who are working on those technologies, what are your thoughts about getting beyond the initial models and, and, and actually propagating those in a way that where people adopt them, they become part of the community of people who care about privacy? I mean, there's nothing that makes you more more um, passionate about it if you're an actual practitioner. You know, use these tools, you want to tell your family about it, you want to tell your friends about it, get them involved. Um, what are the thoughts about how that, how long that process may take and, and where we are now? So, in some ways, I'm actually fairly pessimistic about culture driving those kinds of behavioral changes um, separate from the technological ecosystem. I think that to a certain degree, people's behavior online is somewhat shaped by the set of tools that they have available and the affordances of those tools and the way they encourage them to interact with ecosystems, um, with, with software ecosystems and, and information ecosystems. And I think that we see people adopting platforms and protocols because those are the things that are cool, those are where their friends are, um, much more so than thinking, I want to be specifically secure, I'm going to specifically change the way I use the existing tools that I have available to me. Um, they may change their own behavior around, for instance, what they say online. Um, that's more at a social level, though, instead of their technical behavior online. So I think that one of the one of the biggest things that we need to see to see significant adoption of encryption tools is to win startup founders over, to win, to change the, the development culture that begins those projects, the culture of the of the communities where these tools are coming out of, so that you get tools that have that focus, you get tools that drag people in the direction, and not not the tools from this community. I'm not talking about Tor, I'm not talking about Briar, I'm not talking about any of these things that we might suggest, you know, that we would think to suggest that people should use, because that's, that doesn't really matter. You know, the security of WhatsApp has far more of an impact on, on messaging security globally than OTRs had, you know, than, than, you know, for all that we've, all of this community spent so much time concentrating on some of these higher security tools um, you, you, know, you have to go where the users are if you want to actually change the security footprint of mass populations. So I don't think we can get security for all people all the time. I hope we can get security for the people who need it when they need it, or the people who want it when they want it. And I'm okay with the notion that that's not everybody, that's not even significantly everybody. In order to get that class of user who has an idea of what they want in terms of secure communication, in terms of privacy, and give them something truly usable, we haven't even hit that hurdle yet, let alone mass adoption. And the few projects that are edging in that direction have actually done relatively well. CryptoCat, for instance, for example. CryptoCat is a encrypted instant messaging application. You know, text you type on your computer, someone sees it on their computer, web browser to web browser. It is anonymous, it's encrypted, it's relatively easy to use. And the user experience of approaching that is they open the application in their web browser and they just type in the name of the chat room they want to be in and they start typing. And it is that simple. They're not worried about managing their keys, they're not worried about installing complicated software. They don't have to do anything more than type in the, the room they want to be in, their name, and press a button. That level of, of ease is what it takes for people to use this software. And once you achieve that, where it doesn't look any different or feel any different 
from the insecure chat application that they were using last week, that's when people start using stuff. That's, that's how you drive adoption. And then you need to get those people using it and they start using it for secure stuff and then they start using it for random communication with the other people that they're already talking to in that space. And you grow a community around it. And so that's what adoption looks like in, in my corner of the world where I look at, you know, if you have 100,000 people connecting through your platform in a month, that's pretty good, right? That's, that looks like something that's actually usable that people are using in earnest for both things that matter and for things that don't matter. And once you start building on that, you've got an adoption story you can, you can really tell. But it starts with what are the barriers to actually using the thing. And it has to be as easy to use as the insecure thing. So very quickly, two, I have two contrary thoughts on this. One is um, I, I very much agree with, with what's been said. Uh, but I think there's a, a, a smaller set of choices or a smaller set of, of a, a constraints in an environment in which this really does make a difference. And the, my big, biggest data point on this is, is Germany, where Firefox has a much better share of the web browser market than it does in other countries. And one of the major reasons that's usually pointed to for this is that Firefox is open source and considered to be more respective of privacy of its users than other web browser manufacturers. And I believe that to be true, not merely a random happenstance or coalition. Um, but that's a different kind of thing, right? We're still talking Firefox versus Chrome versus Safari versus Internet Explorer. We're not talking Firefox versus the Tor browser, right? So you have to have a very constrained environment before a critical measure <coughs> of normal users' choice and preference for privacy and security really makes a significant difference, in my opinion. Um, and that, I think, is the reason for, for my other thought, which is, you know, there's a reason a lot of us are talking about uh, encryption by default, right, as, as one, of the, one of the things that we need to be talking about more. Um, not just HTTPS as an option, but HTTPS by default, which the EFF has been pushing for a very long time. Um, make it harder to not be secure than to be secure in the services and in the applications that people are already using as LSA. And that's, that's, I think, the best hope we have of getting, uh, you know, a, a healthy, not a complete, but a healthy degree of security for the average user against criminals who are sitting on their Wi-Fi network, against uh, all sorts of different kinds of attackers and threats. Great, and, and we, we have about 10 minutes left. I want to make sure we get to questions, if there are, if there are any. Yes. Um, just the more I think a lot of these issues through, kind of the more pessimistic and down I feel. So a real general, can we get some optimistic ideas about the future or anything here? I mean, you can say on balance how you feel optimistic, <laughs> pessimistic, but something positive coming out of it. I have, I have sort of a mixed, um, a mixed response to that, which is also a question, because it, it's, um, we talked about the technology, and, and, and obviously, do this new technology, you know, costs money. And we talked a little bit about policy, but we didn't really talk about the state, and, and in particular, the State Department, which has been through the Broadcast Board of Governors, through um, various organs, supporting the creation of a lot of this technology. Um, and they, just as I understand, increased the amount of money that will be going through Congress. And, uh, and recently, Dan uh, Gilmore, who writes a lot about these issues, wrote a piece in The Guardian about how foundations can come in, and he suggested, so a suggestion I think probably a lot of us support, that the major foundations each put forward, 10 largest foundations each put forward $50 million each um, and uh, to create a fund that would support the, the creation of this technology. So it's kind of a, it, it's very optimistic that they're thinking about it, and they're thinking about the money that would allow us to solve these problems that may give you some optimism. But I, but I also think the issue of the State Department, with it, when it comes, the State Department, Congress's involvement, the government's involvement, um, when it comes to creating technologies that may get around things that other aspects of the state are trying to control, um, is an interesting problem. And I'm wondering, Chris, since you've seen this work on many sides of that issue. What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was, I was at the State Department managing grants that, that were part of this portfolio. Uh, it's, 
it's work that has a tremendous footprint, and that was actually another comment that I forgot to make earlier about funding. Um, there is this nice pool of money that's going to support these things, however, it's two orders of magnitude up from the funding that's on the other side. Uh, so funding matters. In, in big, is that right, about two orders of magnitude? Four. Four. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, it's, it's, I think it's reason to be optimistic, though, and I think the main reason that I would be, make it optimistic is to pair it with what uh, Ellen and, and technologists in the space have been doing in the past decade, which is, uh, I think, totally, totally transforming um, both the, these tools themselves and how effective they are at being strong security tools and how usable they are and how much they are able to be used by real people when they want to, as James puts it. It's still not for everybody for everybody to use, but people who want to can now download the Tor browser bundle, and it's you go to the website, you download it, and you click on it, and it works. And 10 years ago, like, there was nothing anywhere vaguely like that. So I'm optimistic about the tool. I'm optimistic about the growth of people and community and funding that are working to support this ecosystem. And I, although maybe in the minority, I'm optimistic about where we're going to go with policy and law as well. So I'm an all around optimist. So the uh, brief history of the network is one of increasing hostility to freedom and decreasing room for freedom. And we are just recently getting serious about protecting users in a hostile network environment. The trend of governments ramping up both legal authority and technical capability to censor and surveil is not going to change. The availability of technology to help people in those, in those systems still operate, have their free communication and their secure, secure communication, that stuff we're going to keep working. So far, we've been effective in certain places. We've learned a lot. We're building on that. As a community, in the last few years, I've seen a tremendous growth in the sophistication of the kinds of software being made the skill sets of the people making that software, the professionalism of this niche of people working together, the amount of collaboration. We are, in terms of finding ways to protect people and building technology to do that, everything is getting better and we are not done improving the infrastructure for making that better. So I'm optimistic about what we can do but I'm realistic about the fact that the threat on the other side is also continuing to grow. And there will come a time in the future when the capability of people with entire network perspectives and the ability to do real-time monitoring is going to make a lot of the current work obsolete. And so we need to be thinking about that future as well. So yes, there's a lot of threats and there's a lot of pitfalls along the way but I am definitely optimistic about being able to continue to carve out space for free communication and secure communication for people when they need it most in the worst places. So I have, I have a couple points of optimism. Um, I'm optimistic that our friends in the policy world can um, effectively make sure that no one does anything. Um, that's, that's where I think the bar um, of what we're going to get out of policy is, is that we can, we can stop things from getting any worse on, on the policy side. Um, well, no, and I think, that, I think that that's actually great because that's basically what we, what we really need there is to not have to fight any more of an uphill battle. If we get any actual wins there, like wonderful, I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that, but I'm, I'm optimistic that if we can keep the policy space from shifting any further, which I think we can do, we can win on those terms. Um, there are two other things that make me fairly optimistic about the future of a lot of this stuff. Um, one is that, um, so the internet is actually pretty old, and I don't think the history of the internet is actually just declining freedom. Um, the past 10 years of the internet are that, but the internet has a much older prehistory um, back when no one used it. And um, if you go talk to the old guys who did that design work, um, they had some fairly specific sets of politics that they designed, in, you know, designed with in mind when they were building a lot of those very early protocols. 
And if you look at what the stuff that they were designing at the time means politically now, those, those politics have bred pretty true. And this tells me that we can, over, over a 40 or 50 year period, design political ideas into technology and have them actually have the impact on the world that we thought they would. Now, the reason the internet doesn't mean exactly what those guys thought it would mean when they did a lot of the design work is because we've added more layers and because things have shifted in context. But for the bits that they design, they still mean pretty much what they thought they did. Um, and those old guys now are, by the way, incredibly furious. Um, and this is one of the other things that makes me pretty hopeful is, you know, the IETF is coming out swinging. This is not a thing that the IETF, this does not come naturally to the IETF. Um, the IETF is sort of like, in some ways, the old codger at the end of the bar. I'm like, wow, he just decked a cop. It only so, um, <laughs> in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, they, we are actually seeing um, some fairly fundamental infrastructure redesign work. I don't know if it's been adopted formally, but at least at the November IETF meeting, it's being mooted that um, no RFC that specified plain text communication should ever be approved again. You know, that we're just, we're just done with that. We're never going to standardize another protocol that doesn't have it, that, that um, doesn't have privacy on the wire. Um, and my last point of, of optimism is that consumer technology doesn't really matter in some ways. Um, the enterprise drives technology development and technology integration and technology deployment. Um, we have seen fairly conclusively that USG does engage in economic espionage, and there are a whole lot of people in a lot of other countries who are terrified and furious about this. Um, this is doing some fairly nasty things and will be doing some increasingly nasty things to US tech companies' ability to sell overseas unless they spend a lot of money improving the apparent security of their products and even more money figuring out how to transparently demonstrate to people that those products are not backdoored or owned. Um, Cisco alone took, I think, a 10% uh, stock price hit the first quarter after the uh, Snowden revelations came out, in part up based on a 24% sales drop just in Russia. Um, you know, that, that swung $11 billion worth of market cap. Um, we're starting to talk about real money here and not, you know, $50 million real money, but like actual money. Um, and this is one of the things that, you know, for, I mean, the global surveillance space is probably about $300 billion if you look at all of the different agencies around the world in, in very round numbers. Um, the internet's a $3 trillion industry. You know, we do actually outswing them 10 to 1. Um, and as a lot of that stuff on the enterprise scale ends up moving out of necessity to fighting intelligence scale threats, we're going to see a very, very different footprint in five or ten years, regardless of what we do. I mean, in some ways, I think our job in the, in the kind of internet freedom oriented tool community, once that momentum gets going, it's just going to be to keep up. And I'm going to use the moderator's prerogative just to, to close this out. There's about two minutes to go, unless there's a question. Do you want to ask a question? Uh, not necessarily a question, but uh, maybe just half sure. of it. Uh, just to say, essentially, uh, to start from the, from the Occupy uh, movement, uh, Bernard Jinzhou and U.S. Japan China Comparative Policy Research Institute, and um, I, I can fear uh, the technologies advancement, but I think people forget uh, some historical uh, lesson. You say when we, when we saw the open uh, movement, actually, if people have some knowledge of anarchist uh, movement, you, we, can, we can say direct action into whatever. So you can learn that, and then you can get the strengths and the weakness for the, the open uh, movement. And what I want to say is that, uh, and, and you mentioned that the, the government or the, some fund to sponsor or some, some good initiative, to, uh, that's, that's, that's a joke. <laughs> because uh, 
when you say like a like a, like a practi practitioner or victim, um, girl, a refugee, uh, last year when I was threatened by a big company's agent, life threatened, and because he, he said you, you you have no power because the, the, the agent said I have power to uh, connect with American uh, companies to organize uh, Congress hearing, and then the company certainly is afraid of the Congress hearing, so the company eventually. Ask me, can you uh, have a connection to uh, American Congress to organize a hearing? If you cannot, uh, then we cannot listen to you. So I, I, I guess this example is that we still have to go back to the you said, uh, tradition or non-technical issue to have an effective way to influence the public policy. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, just, to, just to close out, I mean, I did, uh, the issue of Optimism, and since I, my organization does a lot of organizing around these issues, I mean, you know, take note that we did, uh, you know, there, the last 10 years have also been a period of very effective organizing, both online and in communities, around issues like net neutrality, uh, which was 2006, 2007, when we stopped that legislation, uh, around issues of copyright reform. Everybody, of course, re refers to the, the events of uh, protests that happened in the United States and around the world. Uh, that were very effective in stopping legislation, uh, and uh, and so while we um, we're pretty good at stopping legislation, I'd like to think that we can take the momentum, the organizing, the coalition building that occur around net neutrality, that occur around copyright reform, that, that are occurring right now with organizations like the Stop Watching Us Coalition around privacy issues, to actually start passing legislation, so we're not always in the position of fighting that policy, stopping that policy, but actually implementing policy that will open up the airwaves, that will protect um, our rights to privacy in ways that are actually really meaningful and help the work that, that these, the good work that these people are doing. Thank you. Thank you.